Thank you all for coming. I, I think we got at least uh, half the people we had last week, so that's a half-life of about a week, maybe. <laughs> Probably some wandering in late still, yeah. So um, as you noticed, we released last week's lecture externally because we didn't talk about anything secret, so I'd like to keep it that way. When we have uh, more Google-specific topics, we'll have, uh, we'll have a private session on that. So if you have questions that relate to uh, anything relevant to your job here, save them to the end and we'll, uh, we'll get at them then. So let's get started. We, we left off in the middle of a bunch of random topics last week, so we're still sort of doing overview of the front end part of photography, of image capture and optics and sensors and color and stuff like that. Not, not so much about what to do with digital images what, once you get them. Uh, that'll all come later. There's a, there's a few optics topics I want to introduce in this, and uh, next week we'll have uh, uh, Rom Clement's going to give us a lecture on, on optics and ray tracing and stuff. We'll get into more depth on some of these things. But there's, um, there's a lot of things that come up in, in lenses when, um, when you have something more than a simple lens. So we, when you don't have just a single element. But for example, here's a, just a drawing of what you can do with two elements. And there's some dotted lines in there that are trying to show you that uh, from the, from the back side of this lens, if you look in there, it looks as if the light is all coming from a pupil or an opening that's, that's here. That is, there's a, there's a virtual image of the stop. The stop is this, this line A that represents an aperture that blocks rays of light any further out from that. So that's the aperture stop. When you, when you look into the lens, you see a, typically a magnified image of the aperture stop, or in some wide angle lenses, if you look in the front, you'll see a, a diminished image of the aperture stop. And that, that virtual image, what you see when you look into it, is called a pupil. So in the front of the lens, you can see the entrance pupil. In the back, you can see the exit pupil. And sometimes they're about the same size, as in this picture, they're not, they're not quite the same size. The entrance pupil is smaller than the exit pupil. In some lenses, they're very different in size. And so there's, uh, um, lenses have what's called a pupil magnification factor, which can be uh, quite large in some cases. So if you, if you pull a lens off a camera that you have, if you have a wide angle lens in particular, and look in the front when it's stopped down a little bit, you'll see a little tiny opening. Turn it around, look in the back, it's got a great large opening. Um, those are the pupils you're looking at. The pupils are relevant for various things that you'll be doing in, uh, in digital photography. For example, in the, the, the exit pupil is relevant because it controls the, the directions of the light rays hitting the sensor. Are we having another earthquake? Someone walking on the roof? No, no, don't know. If you stop down that aperture stop really small to limit the amount of light that comes through the lens to where it's almost just a pinhole, and you look in the back of the lens and you see where that pinhole is, that, that determines where all the light is coming from. That's the center of, the, of the, the pupil that's illuminating your sensor and basically determines what's called the chief ray angle. The chief ray is the ray that comes through the center of your aperture. So when that, when that, uh, that chief ray, the middle of your aperture, is incident on your sensor and it's not coming in perpendicular to the surface of the sensor, some sensors are kind of particular about those angles. And so this, uh, knowing how far the exit pupil is from the focal plane lets you compute, uh, as you get out to the edges of your sensor, lets you compute the angles that those rays are coming in at. And you want to make sure that your lens is compatible with the acceptance angles of your sensors. So that's why the, that's why the exit pupil is a relevant thing in digital photography. It was much less important in the film days because film is, has got a pretty broad acceptance angle. It'll take light from any angle. But digital sensors tend to have little micro lenses on them that concentrate the light into the sensitive photodiode areas. And those, are, those make it uh, pretty directional. Okay. Yeah, of course. Right, so the question is, what does it mean when people say a lens is designed for digital? Part of it is that they're designed for the smaller uh, field of a digital camera, but does it also mean that they have uh, lower chief ray angles, for example? And, and yes, in general it does. For example, uh, well, here's my camera. I have the uh, Sigma SD10, some coincidence there, I guess. Uh, they came out with a really nice normal lens, a fast normal lens. For the smaller sensor size, normal lens is about a 30 millimeter focal length for this camera, and they have a a 1.4, f1.4 lens for it, that's quite fast. If you look at where the exit pupil is on that thing, if it was a simple lens, 
a single element lens. The entrance pupil, exit pupil, and aperture stop are all in the same place, and the distance from the focal plane is equal to the focal length. So it would be 30 millimeters from the focal length. But in fact, for that, uh, that normal lens that's <coughs> optimized for digital cameras, the exit pupil is about 300 millimeters from the focal plane, which means it has a, a pupil magnification factor of something like 10. So it's huge. And most of them are not that extreme. But the lenses that work well with digital cameras usually have a, a distance to the exit pupil of, uh, say, between uh, 80 and 150 millimeters, whereas they're, even when their uh, focal lengths are quite a bit less than 50. So that's important. When you look at the other side, the entrance pupil, what is that good for? And that's, what, what that's essentially good for is making panoramas. If, if I've got a camera here and I want to take a take a couple of pictures over here. I want to take another one here and, and get it to, to stitch together well. I want the viewpoint for these guys and the viewpoint for these guys to be the same. In particular for Jeff in the middle here when he's in both pictures, I want to be shooting him from the same position. So I want to rotate the camera about the entrance pupil because the entrance pupil is where it's what he would see. If he was looking at the camera and I turned it and it didn't move, that's a good thing. That means that his um, things behind him aren't going to shift relative to him. So you won't have distance parallax if you shoot everything from the same position as defined by where the light goes into the camera, which is the entrance pupil. So those are optically important concepts. Uh, there's other concepts about lenses, about various uh, cardinal points and so on that, that we'll mention later. Um, how many people in here have a single lens reflex camera of one sort or another. That's uh, probably about half, okay. So you probably know something about how those cameras work. Um, single lens reflex means that there's a reflex mirror that you're viewing the scene. When you, when you look through your camera, you look through your viewfinder, you're viewing the scene through a mirror and the same lens that you use for taking the picture with. So there are these complicated optical systems where the the mirror here has to get out of the way to take a picture, so it flips up when you push the shutter release. That's why it makes all those clunky noises. But what you might not know is that there's actually a secondary mirror in most of these cameras that's behind the main mirror, and there's a half-silvered region in the center where some of the light goes through, bounces off the secondary mirror, and down to the bottom where there's a little autofocus sensor assembly. And this is because you need, you need some while you're looking at the scene through the viewfinder, the camera wants to be looking at the scene through a mechanism so it can figure out how to focus it ahead of time. So when you push the button, it's done focusing and, and it can take the picture in a hurry. Sometimes uh, there's also secondary optical paths up in the top for an auto exposure sensor. Um, there's all kinds of interesting mechanisms in there and we'll, we'll perhaps talk about, uh, about some of those. But when, when you have a camera that's not a single lens reflex, and there's no reflex mirror in there, and the, the, the main imaging lens is always focusing the image onto the main sensor. You can use the image on the main sensor to, to focus with, but it's harder to get a, a, a good enough, it's harder to get a good fast focus response when what you have to work with is the actual sensor image. These autofocus sensors are very clever because they actually look at the scene through the through two different halves of your uh, main taking lens and try to compare the, the images from the two halves to figure out which way it's out of focus. We might have another look at that later. But So we ramble through a few topics quickly here. There's a question? What's a pentaprism? What's a pentaprism? Pentaprism is the thing on the top there that has five sides to it. You see it's pentagon. It's actually, uh, it's, it's drawn in cross section here as a pentagon. It's got total internal reflection at two of those faces, and it's light going in and out at two of those faces, and another one that looks like it doesn't matter. It's actually more complicated than that because it's a, it's a solid that usually it's a roof prism with some interesting structure in the other dimension to get the image flipped around the right way. Question over here? Um, so when you actually do the exposure to a set time, like the half of a second, is it the mirror that controls that or the actual? Ah, good question. What controls the exposure time when you set it to something like a hundredth of a second? Is it the mirror or is it the aperture? It's neither of those things. It's in fact, uh, this line here represents a focal plane shutter 
This is the sensor back here, and shortly in front of it is a, uh, an arrangement that's usually made with two curtains. The curtain will be closed, and then first curtain will drop to start the exposure, second curtain will drop to terminate it. And if you set it for a really short exposure time, the first curtain starts to drop, and the second one starts to drop right behind it, and you get a slit going across the sensor to expose it for a two thousandth of a second. <coughs> Both film and digital cameras use essentially equivalent shutter mechanisms, mechanisms there. Pardon me? Not point and shoot Not point two what? Point and shoot digital. Oh, not point and shoot digitals, no. S SLRs use this kind of mechanism. Point and shoot digitals, uh, typically when the lens is not interchangeable, they integrate the shutter into the lens assembly somewhere. Uh, even some, let's see. Even so, non yeah, all, almost all non-SLR cameras use a in-the-lens shutter. In particular, if the lens is not interchangeable, you can put your shutter in the lens. Some SLRs may also use an in-the-lens shutter. For example, the um, Hasselblad's medium format SLRs. They have a complicated <coughs> mechanism where they the, the shutter in the lens is normally open so you can look through it. And when you want to take a picture, it closes the shutter, raises the mirror, opens something to expose the film, then it opens the shutter again, closes it again, and, and when, you re when you wind the camera, it resets it all back to normal. Yeah, hi. Uh, why not do it electronically? I know sometimes it is done electronically. Why not yeah, the question is why not do it electronically? So you, you can make sensors that have what's called electronic shuttering, where they um, they'll be sensitive to light for some interval of time and then under electronic control they stop being sensitive to light and you read out the signal. It's hard to do that well. Some uh, very low-end cameras do that. Cell phone cameras generally work that way. It's hard to make a image sensor be not sensitive to light. And it's hard to store the charge signal during that interval when you're trying to read it out in a way that's separate from storing it on the photodiode that is sensitive to light. So, so um, I've made cameras that work that way. I'll show you one, but uh, in general, it's, um, if you can use a shutter, you're way better off. Okay, more questions on that one? Some use a combination. Some use a combination, yeah. You can do like a half shutter where you, <clears throat> you electronically can reset the thing and then start integrating photo charge at a certain time under electronic control and then terminate it by closing a shutter. That's called a half shutter and things like that. So <clears throat> the, the point of this slide is just to say that when, you, when you're doing photography, you need some processing infrastructure. You need to be able to take the images out of your camera and have some kind of standard ways of, of processing the images and making them into good pictures. You also need some flexibility. You need to be able to tune and adapt your process to your needs over time. And fortunately, we don't have to do that in the field by standing under a black cloth anymore, although if you have a typical laptop display, you might still want to use a black cloth. Um, but you don't have to use the nasty chemicals that we used in the old days. I don't have a good uh, public domain picture of someone, someone using a laptop doing this, but I thought this would be a better illustration of the, the whole idea of, uh, of, of a processing chain. You also need... Uh, good automated back-end processing. And Kodak figured this out a long time ago when they sold a camera with the, uh, with the slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. So that's, I mean, they, they've implemented a processing pipeline. And once, you, uh, once you've captured the image, it's up to them to do something, something standard to get a good image out of it. When you're working with images, you, you really need both of these things. You need a personal infrastructure for processing images, and you need a sort of a standardized high volume infrastructure for processing images. And this, again, just to introduce that concept, I'm not going to say any, any more about it today. I'd like to go back into uh, vision, optics, and color a bit. The human eye, as I mentioned last time, is the, is the ultimate arbiter and consumer of, of these images that we want to make. So you need to understand a little bit about how it works. And it, it works a lot like a camera. It has a lens. It has an entrance pupil, which is what you see when you look in somebody's eye in the middle of the iris. There's a, a little dark area. That's where the light goes in. And in fact, you're seeing a slightly magnified view of what the actual uh, opening of the iris is because of the, the curved surface in front of it. So what you're, what you're seeing, the apparent size of the opening in the pupil is, is in fact literally the entrance pupil. It has this variable iris, the iris diaphragm. Uh, the, 
in the eye it's called an iris. In a camera it's called an iris diaphragm when it's a variable thing that works like the eye. Um, and an image forms back here and it doesn't have a flat uh, film plane or sensor plane the way cameras tend to, tend to have but it has a spherical one and it, it works well enough. In the, in fact, probably works better than flat. In the center, there's a there's a thin area where, where you don't have so many nerve fibers sitting on top of the photoreceptor cells. That's called the fovea centralis, and that's that's <clears throat> when you look right at something and you see a lot of detail. You're you're aiming your eye to put the image right into the fovea here, and it's only about a degree or two wide. And that's the region that's dedicated to high resolution color vision. It's also the reason why if you look at a dim star at night, you can't see it because there are, no, uh, there are no high sensitivity cells in there. There's no rods. So you see with rods and cones, the, the cones come in three types and they, they mediate color vision and the rods are for low light level vision. And since there's no rods in this area, at night when you look at the sky and you see stars all over, you're seeing them all, all out here. But when you look right at a dim one, you can't see it because you don't have anything sensitive enough there to pick up really dim light. So it's a pretty interesting structure. If you look in the fovea, you see the cones tightly packed. They're these, these kind of long, skinny, tapered cells, sort of cone-shaped, and they're, they're packed in columns. And if you probe individually through a bunch of those with a microscope, a microprobe of some sort, and see how they respond to different wavelengths of light, you can get all these, these plots of response versus wavelength. And you can classify the cones into three different types, depending on whether they peak up at a, at a longer wavelength, a medium wavelength, or a shorter wavelength. And we might refer to those as red, green, and blue, although they're more properly called long, medium, and short. And the, that defines a color space called LMS color space, long, medium, short, cone color space. There's very few blue ones in the fovea, and some sources say there aren't any, but this guy says he found a few. So that means if you, if you look right at something like uh, yellow text on white paper, the only difference between yellow and white is how much blue light is being reflected there. If you look at yellow text on white paper, it's very hard to read. Um, you can see that it's yellow, and if you look at it you know, peripherally, it's, yellow makes a great highlighter for marking large areas because you can detect that outside the fovea, but the yellow text on white paper, the, the detail is all in the blue, and you have very little sensitivity or detail to the blue in here. That's why with digital images, you can blur the blue channel or the, the blue-yellow direction, the B channel of lab space it's called. You can blur that a lot and not notice it. So we're going to talk a lot about color, color vision and color sensing. I'd like to go back to uh, James Clark Maxwell. In, uh, in 1860 he did some experiments on, and came up with what we now call color matching functions. And this has to do with how to, how to mix different lights to get um, to match a certain color, say a single wavelength of light or some other um, some other different mixture, and he he figured out what it meant to have three primary colors. And there was a theory around for some time due to Thomas Young from about 1800 about the um, about the eye having really three different um, dimensions of of color perception, which are these these three primaries, these three sensations. And Maxwell figured out that th this is right, that there are these three separate sensations in the eye that correspond to these three cone types we were talking about, but that you can't stimulate these three sensations independently of each other. So for example, if you pick different wavelengths of light, and I'm not sure what the units are that he's numbered in here, but uh, I, I think it was kind of an arbitrary scale on his prism or something, that he's, he's plotted these curves, blue, green, and red, that correspond to his idea of what might be going on with these three sensations that he's stimulating. And in general, there's, um, there's always more than one being stimulated. He, he may have already done some, some processing here because I see he's got curves that go negative, which is, um, yeah, so these are done in terms of the mixtures of certain colors of lights. And sometimes the, to match a certain wavelength, you need negative amounts of some primary color, which seems unintuitive. But that's, that's something that's very important, again, in understanding, for example, how a cathode ray tube color triangle relates to negative values of color matching functions and colors that are outside the reproducible gamut and so forth. So Maxwell pretty much figured this stuff out back in 1860 and had this notion of a, of a color triangle and understood what it meant for a color to be in the triangle or outside the triangle. 
And he also made the first color photograph. And, and this, this theory of trichromatic color vision came to be known as the young Helmholtz theory because uh, Thomas Young had uh, originated it and Hermann Helmholtz did some work on it. But Maxwell's really the guy that figured it out and made it work. And he made the first color photograph by taking a picture of this tartan ribbon through three different uh, jars of colored liquid. He dissolved different chemicals in water to make filters. If you read his paper, he'll tell you how much of what chemical to dissolve and what volume of water if you want to reproduce this experiment. And he took the three pictures through that, and then he took the, he developed the negatives and turned them back to positives, and he projected them back through three jars of liquid and did this demo in front of the Royal Society in London. So he was able to produce on a screen a color image about like this. It's not a great color image. It was, it was enough to show the kind of the three-dimensionality of color, but it wasn't a great color image because at that time, none of the photographic materials that were in existence were sensitive to red light. And so to get, to get anything resembling trichromatic color, he had, had to kind of fake it. And he knew that in his paper. He mentioned that it would work a heck of a lot better if they had materials that were sensitive to red light. They could do blue light and they could do green light, but for the red channel, I think they actually used some ultraviolet. And so they got they got three color channels, but they got kind of a false color. Yeah, Lance? Was it a revolutionary development? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure what the reaction was. I wasn't there, but um, uh, it seems revolutionary when you read about it. I, I have, um, I brought a few books today. One of the books I have called uh, Sources of Color Science has three of Maxwell's papers in it and you know they were important enough that in retrospect they were selected among the world's top dozen papers in color science. Uh, it, it was quite a big deal. I mean the first color photograph I think it's quite a big deal. I'll show you some more early color photos in a minute here. Yeah. Um, so you've got four different kinds of receptors in, with four different spectral response functions in your eye. Why do you, why don't you have four colors? Okay, so Ian asks, if you have four different color receptors, that is three cones and the rods, why don't we have four-dimensional color perception? And the answer is that actually we do, but there's only kind of a narrow range of intensities over which that matters. And what, what happens is when, when you're in kind of normal room light like this where you see a lot of color, the rods are pretty much all saturated out. They're not doing much for you. When you're in dim light, um, you know, under starlight or something, the cones have no response at all and you, you have sort of monochromatic vision. But somewhere in between, like if you're sitting around a campfire where you've got, um, you, you've got kind of enough light to see, maybe some moonlight, starlight and so on, you've also got the, the red glow of the campfire, you actually have kind of a, kind of a limited color space there where you, you're sort of trading off the long wavelength cones illuminated by the red glow of the campfire against the response of the rods from the other shorter wavelength. But there's only a very narrow range where all four of these things come into play. And it, people have studied it and they've tried to make a sort of a modified four-dimensional color space. But it, it doesn't buy you much. It's not worth a lot because uh, people normally don't want to be looking at colors in such dim lights. And so if you're, if you're doing photography and trying to produce stuff to look at, it doesn't really buy you anything. Yeah, Lance? Yeah, Lance points out some people have four cone types. Um, that's pretty rare. A lot of people have two cone types, and some only have one, but very few have four. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, question is, do pigeons have four? Uh, I don't know about that. I hadn't heard that, but they, they, animals have a wide variety of different kinds of color vision. It's quite fascinating. So if we were going to be designing photography for the pleasure of pigeons and other animals, we'd have a kind of a different game, but the same, the same kind of theory would apply, I think. Yeah. In, in our evolutionary tree, we used to have four, but then we lost two of them. One got dissipated. One of the remaining ones that was left got dissipated into two. Huh. So he says we had four evolutionarily at some point, and we'd lost two of those and split one of the others into the two, the medium and short, medium and long. Yeah, and question here? And also, uh, most birds have four with a little bead of oil over each coat that focuses the light better. Okay, so birds have four types with little beads of oil acting as microlenses over the cones. Very clever, those guys. <laughs> 
Wow, I'm learning a lot here today. Thanks. <laughs> so this is just a representation of a um, that you'll see a lot. This this space. This is what we call X Y space. It's called a chromaticity space, which means it it represents the the hue and saturation of a color without regard to brightness, intensity, or luminance. So it's only a, it's a two-dimensional color space that lets you distinguish nominally different colors without worrying about the white, gray, black dimension. Um, this space and the, uh, the, the precursors that it depends on were all defined in 1931 at a standards meeting of this uh, CIE. This is, uh, I don't do French, but this is some commission illumination stuff, right? Someone can tell me what that means. But, um, they define these what are called color matching functions or tristimulus curves and basically these can be used to measure a color if you have if you represent a color by a spectrum of light say you have a surface that has some reflectance spectrum and you illuminate it by a light that has some emission spectrum the, the product of those gives you the reflected light spectrum and that's like an infinite dimensional thing you don't really want to deal with that. You want to reduce it to a three-dimensional subspace that represents what the three cones in the human eye would detect. And you could do that by using the, the three response curves of the three types of human cones. But what they did instead in the CIE was to define these other color matching functions that are a, a linear transformation of the three that will get you into the same subspace but with different axes. And they define them in such a way that this one in the middle, which is called the Y curve, um, has, a, has a value that's, that's at every wavelength is proportional to the, uh, the extent to which light of that wavelength will give you a, a perception of brightness. So what this is telling you is that stuff in the 500 to 600 and some region is a lot brighter than stuff out near 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. So, uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a concept of luminance. Luminance is a, uh, is a defined uh, photometric term that means the, the dot product of this Y curve with the spectrum of a light uh, falling on a surface, or not falling, coming from a surface. So the, the Y curve was picked to define luminance, and then the other curves were picked to, um, to give you two color dimensions that are um, they're not exactly orthogonal to luminance, but they give you the extra information. And, and they were picked with some certain properties as well. So the, the, the Z curve was picked to be a narrow, compact blue channel, to be as low as possible over here, but not negative anywhere. And then the red curve was picked to, to give you the, the, there was nothing left to pick at that point. It's, it's determined to give you the right three-dimensional uh, subspace that one's determined at that point. When you, when you take a, a spectrum and you use these three curves to project it down into a three-dimensional subspace, you get a three vector called XYZ that represents the color of that light. This subspace should have the property that if two different spectra look the same to a human, that is they're the same color, then they give you the same XYZ value. And if they look different to a human, they give you different XYZ values. So that doesn't mean that the human internally represents X, Y, and Z anywhere, but it means that the, what happens when light goes into the eye is these long, medium, and short cones respond with their three color matching functions, and they give you, they, they reduce the spectrum to this three-dimensional subspace. If we can, with curves like this, get to that same subspace, even though it's on different axes, then we should have this property that points that look the same to the human are the same XYZ coordinates and things that look different to the human are different XYZ coordinates. That's, that's kind of the ideal on which uh, colorimetry and color matching is based. If you take the X and Y coordinates, that is, uh, well, take all three coordinates, the, the X, the Y, and the Z that you get from these three curves, you take each of X, take the sum of those three, X plus Y plus Z, and divide that into the X and divide it into the Y. That's how you get the little X and the little Y that are plotted here. So this is just the big X and little Y, big X and big Y divided by the sum of the three. And that's how you get rid of the, the overall level dependence. 
and that defines these coordinates, this, these x and y, which can't be greater than 1, obviously, because you're dividing x by x plus some other things that can't be greater than 1. So there's a, there's a triangle here that goes from 0, 0, out here to 1, 0, and up here to 0, 1, and here's the other edge of the triangle. And all colors have to sit within that triangle. And you can define other color spaces. I should mention what Erwin Schrodinger did. It's a little bit out of sequence. Uh, but I show this here just to show that before the CIE standardized all this stuff in 1931, a lot of good scientists were experimenting with it and trying to figure out how to measure and represent color. Schrodinger had figured out that there's this uh, Color is basically a, it, well, it's a three-dimensional vector space. Maxwell knew that, and people knew that for a long time. But he, he characterized the shape of that space, and he showed that you could, you could kind of slice it and get this curve, which, uh, so here's a, a schnitt, a cut, where he's cut this, this three-dimensional solid that has black at the apex over here. And the shape of this thing here is the same as what we saw on the previous side, the, the shape of the boundary of this region is the, the coordinates that you go through when you, when you use a monochromatic light source that varies from long wave here through shorter and, and, and you know, all the way from red back to violet here. So that shape was already known. Um, Schrodinger had mapped it out pretty well here. He showed how to make color triangles around it by projecting this red-green edge and this violet indigo edge out and, and this edge between red and violet and making a triangle that would fit as close as possible to that space of colors. When the, the CIE didn't choose that triangle, they could have, they chose a bigger triangle that didn't fit as tight. He also showed this thing, the spectral curve, where if you take a given intensity of light and you start out at, uh, start out at red and you, you bring the wavelength down, it gets to be more and more visible and it goes around this curve and comes back to, back to black again after violet. So he had pretty well mapped out everything, but he didn't reduce it to uh, kind of standard standard vectors, and these guys did in 1931. And more recently, there's a, there's a new standard that everyone uses. Here's a question. Um, how does the closeness of the triangle matter? Okay, how does the closeness of the triangle matter? Um, let me say a few words about that now, because the standard we all use now for RGB color on computers, uh, with some exceptions, but mostly we use this thing called sRGB, which is a, the little s was meant to stand for standard because Hewlett Packard and Microsoft had the power to make it a standard when they defined it. And it's now an international standard adopted by the IEC and the CIE and the IEEE and, and all these other guys, um, ISO. Um, it has a color triangle too. And in this case, the triangle, just like we have this big triangle out here that has all the colors inside of it, the sRGB space has a smaller triangle. And these are all the colors that you can represent by taking um, values of R, G, and B that are positive or non-negative. And the values of R, G, and B are what you get by taking these color matching functions and doing a dot product with the spectrum of the light. And you notice all of these functions have negative regions, which means that if you have a monochromatic light, say, here, at the, where the red curve is most negative, that means that the the red value that you get for that color of light is quite negative, the blue value is zero, and the green value is positive. And if you work out what color that is in, uh, in XY space, you can show it on this picture, and it's, it's out here somewhere. Where the, the blue was zero, which means you're over on this edge, and the, well, it's not what it means. Uh, you're out here somewhere. And what that means is the, because red is over here, Red is kind of measured from this line, positive this way. Negative red is anything to the left of that edge of the color, color triangle. So this is an example of where the color triangle is made quite small. If you make the color triangle uh, sort of as tight as you can to this space, and you can see the XYZ triangle is pretty tight. It's tight on this side. It's, it hits the bottom, and it hits over here. But what, what Schrodinger had proposed was to put an edge parallel to the the blue, the, the violet indigo edge here, and that would make a, a triangle that's kind of long and skinny out there, and then another edge right here. So as long as the triangle contains all of the colors, you can represent with positive numbers any color. But 
on computers, we don't normally want to do that because what, we'd, what we really want to represent are colors that we can make on a monitor, usually. And that's where the RGB spaces on computers come from. To produce a color on a monitor, you have to mix three primary color sources. And when you do that, you can, you can pick three primaries anywhere you want in this space. But when you do that, the triangle defined by those three corners is not going to be able to get you all colors. And that's what Maxwell was able to figure out. There's the notion of three primary colors giving you all colors only sort of works. It only works for colors inside the triangle defined by those three colors, unless you have a way to make negative amounts of a primary, which we normally don't with light. You can match negative amounts by adding neutral white light to one of the colors you're matching, and you can use that to experimentally measure curves like this, but you can't produce those colors by mixing those three primaries. Yeah, Lance? Yeah, so Lance says if you have a technology that lets you absorb some wavelengths from ambient light, you might be able to simulate that effect. Um, maybe. I, I don't know of any technologies that work that way. Peter? Well, yeah. So what's, what prevents optimizing this curve to, uh, to give you more of that space? In fact, the, you can do that. And there's a lot of different color spaces. sRGB was, is kind of a poor man's standard in that it was defined to represent what your average monitor does as opposed to some ideal that you'd like to approach. A lot of other color spaces have been defined. For example, Adobe RGB puts the green primary right up around here. And it gets you a lot more uh, saturated yellows and a lot more of these blue-green colors. The CIE defined an, X, an RGB space the same time they defined XYZ that had uh, monochromatic primaries. So they used 700 red, uh, I think 420 violet, and 545 green. It still left out some colors, but they picked, uh, they did it for more metric purposes than reproduction purposes, and they picked this wavelength of green to be something that was easy to produce with a mercury light source instead of something that would give you all the colors you want. <clears throat> These guys were very practical. Now, Peter? Why can we see the colors that are outside the triangle? Why can we see them? <laughs> yeah. We, we simulate colors out here so you can see something. Uh, the kind of colors that you get in this space that you can't really get in sRGB are like the deep blue-green color of a pool table felt. Um, there aren't a lot of things around that are that saturated that, that you have a problem with them. And this, this looks like a large part of the color space, but the probability of any surface reflectance being out here is extremely low. It's hard to make colors out there, so you're not really losing nearly as much as it looks like. If you look at what, what colors you can, can you produce by mixing the magenta, yellow, and cyan colorants that are used in printing colored images, uh, you get kind of a blob in the middle. You can't get out near these primaries at all, but you can get a little bit outside this edge. So there's some colors in here that you can print that you can't represent in sRGB, and that's why Adobe defined Adobe RGB for people that are in the, the print industry that want to be able to print, print everything they can with their inks. A question here. Yeah. Why would you not want to always use a broader color space? Ah, excellent, excellent question. Um, so you can use Adobe RGB, say, which is, it's a, it's a very commonly, widely supported, larger color space that'll get you more colors. And what happens if you use it, it it's, on most digital cameras, it's an option. Most raw converters, it's an option, well supported in Photoshop and other programs and so on. So if you save your image in Adobe RGB color space and you put it up on your web server and say, look at my pretty pictures, what happens is people download your pictures, and most browsers are not smart enough to look at the profile and realize it's Adobe RGB and convert it back to the sRGB that their monitor can display. They just treat the numbers and display them just as they would sRGB. And the result is that if you had a, if you had a fairly saturated green in your picture that would have looked like like, you know, 0, 200, 0 in sRGB space and just turn on the green primary on your monitor. Because the, the Adobe primary is way up here, now that 
that looks relatively unsaturated relative to what they think the primary is, they'll put out a number that's maybe 50, 250 or something. When you display it, it's greatly unsaturated. And flesh tones move toward a kind of a gray ashen color and so on. So if you put images out in a great wide gamut color space and people view them in sRGB, they look awful. So that's why you don't use it. You only use it if you have complete end-to-end -end control over what's going to happen with those color numbers. If you don't, you better you stick with sRGB, which is really um, not much penalty. Like I said, all you lose is a few of these deep blue-green colors that you could print, and that's about it. Yeah, Bob? Okay, I'm not sure I understand Bob's question, which is, does the rarity, the uh, rarity of these colors have anything to do with its application and high visibility applications? High, high vis yellow does not have Oh, high vis yellow. So high vis yellow is really kind of over here. The 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 wavelength that's most luminous is about 550, and that's kind of a limey greenish yellow. So like tennis balls and so on are. are, are the kind of as reflective as possible in the red and green parts of the spectrum and, and absorptive in the blue part. So those are, those are captured pretty nearly in most color spaces. It's really only these kind of deep blue-green felt color things that, are, that you're going to miss. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lance asks, aren't those tennis balls actually fluorescent? And yeah, they probably are. Um, yeah, Daniel. Seems like another reason you want to keep the smaller color spaces because when you quantize the two that you plot, you're going to get more resolution than you're interested in. Right. Daniel points out another reason to use the color, the smaller color triangle, is that when you quantize to eight bits, you get more color resolution. You, you resolve the colors more finely when the color triangle is smaller. People cite that a lot. I think it's a pretty small effect, but it is it is real. Yeah. In the back. So, how do you, uh, <coughs> Ah, uh, yeah. Excellent question. That'll, that'll, that'll lead me on to some of my next slides here. The question is, how, how do the primaries of sRGB relate to the primaries of the CCD or the image sensor? And that gets a little bit complicated, but that's where we're going. So let's, let's, let's move ahead. Tal? When you do an on-chain of digital photos, is there any value of having multiple images of the same Okay, another excellent question. Tal asks, if you're going to do a chain of processing, is there any value to having intermediate values outside this color triangle? Absolutely, yes. Um, that becomes especially important when you look at uh, white point adaptation. So, for example, in, uh, if you illuminate a scene with an incandescent light, most of your colors in the XY space are going to be all over here. But when you reproduce that, you really want to move all those colors over and make the scene bluer, even though there was very little blue light in the incandescent illumination. And in particular, there will be colors here that are outside the gamut that when you do white point adaptation, you want to move in gamut. So you don't want to clip the yellow edge before you've done the white point adaptation. I'll say a word in a minute about the, the question about what the, what the spectral sensitivities or primaries of the sensor have to do with all this, but let's look at different methods of sensing color. Wow, the time's going so fast. This, this may have to spill over into a, a third introductory lecture, but that's, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to have the questions and a chance to ramble on about it. This guy, Louis Ducos de Huron, some kind of genius in my book, he, he wrote a paper in which he kind of he laid out all the different ways you could detect color. He talked about using beam splitters, and he made himself a camera that works a lot like this somewhat more modern uh, Devon tricolor camera, where you have three different plates. You have internal pellicle mirrors and filters to separate the incoming light into three red, green, and blue images on three different photographic emulsions and take three pictures. This actually worked really well from moving for getting color images that could go to print, because you could take each of those negatives and make a magenta yellow cyan printing plate from it and print stuff that way. It worked less well for making affordable snapshots, because it's, it's quite a process to realign and reassemble these things. But it worked. He, he laid out uh, some of the other methods of doing color. Uh, this is, well, this is one of the early 
photos he made with, uh, with a three-shot camera, you can sort of see at the edges the three things that he's lined up, and he's got his name on it, Louis Ducos de Horon, 1877. So he was a definite pioneer of color photography. These guys, Auguste and, and Louis Lumiere, who uh, are often remembered for inventing uh, movie making, you know, they were among the guys who figured out how to, how to do cinema. They also did a method of, of uh, shooting color that they called autochrome. And they, they took little grains of uh, potato starch and they, they made vats, three different vats with three different dyes. They dyed some of them green, some of them violet colored, and some of them an orangish red color. And then they mixed them together and put a slurry of this on, uh, on a photographic plate with some lamp black in between so light doesn't leak through. So each of these is like a little color pixel. Light goes through the filter and exposes the plate behind it. And then when they, they would uh, develop the plate with a reversal process, which is like when you're making slides, where you take the areas that got exposed to light, when you develop it, they turn black with silver, you bleach that away, you re-expose it, redevelop it, now you've got a positive, put light back through it, the starch grains are intact through this whole process. So wherever you expose to the orange filter, you reproduce an image. If you got light there, you reproduce with light coming back through that same orange filter, that same bit of potato starch. And you can make color images this way. And they sold plates for people to do this. And other companies sold plates that were prepared for doing this. And it's like the slide film of the day. The development process is a lot like ectochrome with a reversal, double exposure, double developer, re-exposure, bleach, all that kind of stuff. And they made color pictures that are quite nice. They're kind of noisy, splotchy, because you have a random selection of these color pixels all mixed together. You don't have a nice, regular Bayer pattern like we have in the digital sensors nowadays. Lance is itching to ask me something. <coughs> right. So Lance says you can make grains with any sensitivity you like. You're not limited to three or four primaries. That, that's true. However, I want to answer the question that we had in the back. Now, how do, how does, how do the spectra of these, these little color filters relate to the color matching functions and color spaces and so on? And, the stuff, autochrome, the auto here refers to the, the essentially using the same filters for taking and for reproducing color. So, um, and theoretically, basically, it doesn't work because there are no sets of filter transfer functions, filter, you know, spectral uh, transmission curves that you can use that will give you accurate color reproduction this way. Because if you if you pick three sets of, of transmission functions for your filters, say, go back and pick uh, these three. Not that you would pick the XYZ curves, but you could. The, the spectral transmission of a, of a little piece of filter is something that's going to be non-negative. When you, when you measure light with non-negative functions like that, if it's if the curves you choose are going to give you accurate color, that is that they are a linear combination of the three responses of the human cones, then you can map colors this way and you can put onto this XY picture, you can put the triangle defined by the three functions you chose. The triangle defined by these three functions is the one we, we talked about here that goes through 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1. But if you, if you pick any other set of functions that are non-negative and are, and are truly color matching functions, they're going to give you a triangle that, that correctly maps all colors inside that triangle, which means they're going to give you a huge color triangle. To reproduce those colors, you have to mix corresponding amounts of light that correspond to the vertices of those triangles. But the vertices of these triangles don't correspond to any actual light source. They're outside the region of possible colors. So this is always true that if you measure three channels with non-negative transmission curves and those are color matching functions, then you get a color triangle whose primaries are imaginary colors. They're not real colors. So you cannot, there's no spectrum of light that you can use. Uh, let's see if this is the right, right way to say it. Yeah, there's, there's no spectrum of light that you can use such that you drive the amounts by those three measurements and get back the right color. So if I've said that, then you're wondering, well, how the heck does color photography work then? And 
basically then the way it works is you, you either have to tolerate a lot of non-ideality in your color, which is what they did with autochrome. It's kind of pale and it's reds go orange and all kinds of weird things happen. Or you have to put a processing step in between, which is what everyone does in digital cameras called matrixing. And you, even in film you have some form of matrixing with uh, dye couplers and things and fancy chemistry to try to get the colors to come out right. But we'll, we'll talk about this matrixing in a minute or, or in a week or a year or something. Um, so here, here's another method that uh, Louis Ducosta Heron talked about and was uh, probably best implemented by Sergei Mikhailovich Protokin Gorsky, who was the photographer to the Tsar in Russia. These are some pictures he made uh, of the Austro Hungarian prisoners of uh, World War I lined up uh, outside their uh, camp. He has these glass negatives with uh, three, three images on each glass plate, and these are now in the collection of the U.S. Library of Congress, and they've, they've gone to a lot of trouble to take these negatives and reproduce good color images from them, doing the right matrixing to try to get the colors right and so on. And he has a lot of pictures of uh, people standing still, because to do this you have to move the plate and move a filter and expose it three times. So some of the pictures you can see where somebody moved and made great color artifacts. <clears throat> Most of the pictures he's got people just standing still. And of course the, the thing that worked really well in, in color photography was the introduction of these uh, three layer color films where you could measure red, green, and blue in registration all at one time. So with the, you, you had the the beam splitter one-shot cameras and you had the three-plate three-shot cameras and you had the autochrome mosaic type cameras but color film which measured all three colors in all locations all the time with one shot was the real solution and it was really invented by these guys these two Leopolds Manis and Godowski who were musicians and got this crazy idea in their head and convinced uh, George Eastman and uh, Kenneth Mees to support them in Kodak research to develop this film so it's a it's a great a great advance and I'm not going to try to explain in any detail how how Kodachrome works and it, it's really complicated and a real problem to process. Um, the the film technology that really took off is a little bit different it's called Ektachrome and Agfachrome and so on that really dominated that field. When you when you run forward nearly a hundred years and look at what happened in electronic photography it, it goes through all the same steps. So here for example is a three-shot camera that we landed on the moon in 1966 and it's got its its little color test chart in the picture so it can calibrate its images it makes uh, it's got a little color wheel inside the camera here and it rotates and takes three pictures and sends them back on slow scan video so there's a there's a digital camera actually it was analog but an electronic color camera in the 60s I always tell people I think uh, it seems likely that we did three shot electronic photography on the earth before we did it on the moon but I can't find any evidence for that so if you see any let me know we did the beam splitter approach this was uh, used in television cameras uh, throughout the 60s and 70s this is uh, an assembly out of a TV camera in which there in each of these cylinders is a little uh, glass tube a little plumbicon or a highly evolved viticon tube that picks up images there's a prism assembly in here that splits light off for the blue one, the green one, and the red one. By the way, when you, when you get into the digital field and they talk about different format sizes, they have things like half-inch format cameras. That derives from this technology. If you pull the tube out of here and you measure the outside diameter of the glass envelope, it's a half-inch. That defines the half-inch format. It's, it's the size of the rectangular image that you can pick up on the front of a glass tube with an outside envelope diameter of a half-inch. So keep that in mind, that's important. We did a beam splitter uh, prism camera at Foveon that uh, used a slightly different prism geometry and we used CMOS image sensors on the three faces. Looks like we're gonna have to finish up in a minute here. And uh, that was a few years ago. And I think we're just uh, gonna have to, well here, this is, this is sort of the end of this line of stuff and I'll pick up after that next time or, or time after. Basically what's in almost all digital cameras these days is a mosaic sensor, sort of like the autochrome thing, except you get a chance to do some processing in between to do some matrixing and get the colors right. And what's in a few cameras like mine is this three layer, three photodiodes at every location. So you can measure red, green, and blue everywhere and it takes more, more aggressive matrixing to make that work out. 
So let's cut it there. We'll see you next time, and uh, we'll have to work out whether to do the new topic or continue this topic, but I'll let you know. Thanks. Thank you.